I'm Melanie Stegman. I got to Seattle a year and three months ago, and I sat right here right away, came to my first IGDA meeting, and y'all were wonderful. I think I've had beers with uh, like every other person in here. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, short bio, I'm a, um, just skip to the thing. I'm going to talk to you tonight about my brand new game studio. We're called Molecular Jig Games. We're, uh, you know, local. We make games that are based in this universe, not the Star Trek universe or the Lego universe. We're in this one. We just happen to be in a very small part of it. Um, so, what do I do? I'm a biochemist. I did a PhD in uh, cancer-related signaling, and I did a postdoc in tuberculosis-related drug design. So I spent a lot of time explaining to people what the hell I do. <laughs> and people just couldn't get it. Like Even my siblings who had been with me the whole way were like, OK, kind of. And um, so I was driven to explain what's going on. The, the other thing is that one in nine postdocs, so one in nine people who already have a PhD, who already got a postdoc position, and they're making their $36,000 a year, working hard in someone else's lab, one in nine of those people get a job as a professor. And why is that? There's not enough funding for all the scientists who want to work. They're all lined up, they're working seven days a week, 12 hour days, not enough funding. So my goal was to explain to everybody how molecular science works, what proteins are doing, what all those lipids are doing, and all of, all of our cholesterol molecules are doing, so that you would realize how close we are to a lot of really great cures and discoveries. And then you would vote to fund the National Institutes of Health more. <laughs> this is a giant propaganda plan on my part. OK. Uh, so what I do is I decided I would make a game, and then also do evaluation of the game. And so I, f I think there's a lot of you here who would also like to make science games and would also love to get some funding for games. So evaluation of a game, demonstrating that people are learning from your game, is what you need to get um, funding. So um, in the commercial world, you need people to buy your game. In the nonprofit world, you need people to say, oh, I think that could work. And in order to get that, you need evidence and data, and it's all scientific. And so. We're going, to do, we're going to go through all kinds of evaluation that I did, and hopefully you'll find it useful. And you can always ask me in the future for stuff. OK, so this is it, how and why, and uh, what you can, um, the sanity part. Instead of just explaining what I wish I had known, I thought I would just do a little bit at the end in case you're interested how to get funding. OK, so why? Okay, so um, what you guys know about molecular biology is way behind what scientists know about molecular biology. Way, way, way far behind. Um, you, the, um, the development of the computer and the discovery of what the actual structure of, of DNA happened around the same time. And you can walk up to any 10-year-old and ask them what a megabyte is. And they're like, oh, they have all kinds of stuff, knowledge about that, or a video card or a driver or whatever. It, but you might be able to draw a double helix, maybe. And you probably don't know how to draw a protein. And the other thing that a lot of us know already is that learning games don't make us want to play them. Generally, you know, traditionally, when I started, when I left my PhD in, or left my lab in 2008, learning games were like, here's a really long description in text of what you want to do, and then a chance to do it. And here's some more text and a chance to do it. And so. I wanted to try to find a way to make that all better. So, OK. Why does it really matter that uh, people know about molecular biology? Not only for funding for NIH, but also for policy decisions. So we all live in a world where people make decisions, people vote. And if, and if you don't know how infectious disease work, you might not vote for uh, money to support it. A lot of, a lot of these policies decisions are really, really important. Um, evolution, for example, would be a very different debate if everybody knew uh, this kind of stuff. So uh, sugar gets processed in your body by proteins. It turns out sugar gets processed in E. coli's body and in spinach's body and your body by almost exactly the same proteins. So um, 
that's a, a great book that you should go out and buy for all your friends for Christmas, Machinery of Life. <laughs> Only 20 bucks on Amazon. <laughs> okay, so this is, a, this is a, a time for you to think now. Think to yourself, uh, you, have, you have some medicine, like say uh, cold medicine, and you take it, and it goes in your body, and like, where does it go? Like, what happens inside your body? How do you envision your body? Is it a, you know, big ball of water, and now you've put some medicine in it, and medicine diffuses throughout your ball of water, and you have a concentration? Like, what's happening in your body? Do we have a mental picture themselves? Hopefully, it's a little more detailed. Well, what I, what I want to explain is that we know a lot more about what our body's doing than, than, than our own mental images in our head. So um, this is some really neat stuff. It's all about in the book. But most of you are familiar with this, this gray um, picture. is an electron micrograph. And using electrons, you can get to the resolution of, of part of a cell. And you can see uh, cloudy, dark bits, fringy bits on the edges of the membranes. But we also have x-ray crystallography and NMR microscopy, so we can see the structure of proteins. And if you combine those data, um, and also combine a whole lot of biochemical data about the concentration of proteins in each cell and the amount of water versus salts, you can actually draw a picture, like David Goodsell did, of what it must look like on the inside of a cell. And if you're paying attention, you'll know that's an E. coli cell. The yellow strands are DNA. Okay, the next picture is to, to let you know how far along we are with molecular biology knowledge and how sadly the public is behind. We know where your salt molecules are. Those little, little red dots in there um, are salt, and there's another color, pink. So is your sodium and your chloride are surrounded by water molecules. The, the teal with the two little white mouse ears, those are water molecules. And uh, the big, giant pink, well, you know, you can read it. There's ATP in there. There's proteins. Uh, we know this. And the other thing is it's pretty cool. So, like, why wouldn't you want to know it? <laughs> okay, so uh, we're going to get a little topical now. I threw this in today just for this. So, yeah, everyone has seen this image, like, a thousand times on the news. Well, like, what does Ebola do when it gets inside of you? Replicate. What? Replicate. Where does it replicate? Yeah, how does it get inside of your cell? Yeah, how? <laughs> 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 yeah, this is the one little thing that everybody's missing. The one little part of how viruses get inside your body. Who knows how they get inside your body? How they get inside your cell? <laughs> a receptor. That is absolutely right. A receptor. Thank you very much. Receptors are proteins, generally, and they're in the membrane of your cell. They're also in the membrane of the virus in this case. So this is what the Ebola virus really looks like. This is in uh, the protein data bank, molecule of the month. You can go find it. It's awesome. David Goodsell drew it as well. And uh, so what, what that very top protein is, a glycoprotein, that is what binds to receptors on your cells. And without that, it cannot get inside your cells. And usually, it can only get in specific cells. That's why the flu doesn't affect your liver. The flu only affects your airways, because it has a specific receptor that binds to airway receptors. And this is pretty cool, right? I mean, look at this bad guy. He's got surface receptors that make him affect different cells. He's got structural proteins that make him bendy or not bendy. I mean, this is really awesome, like way cooler than Pokemon, <laughs> basically. And it's also endless bad guys. OK, so what I wanted to do was introduce this to players. How are we going to use the players? So I'm going to just skip, show you an awesome video of uh, surface molecules as I introduce them in immune defense. There's no audio, but imagine how somebody feels. Uh, this is our microbiome. You can modify the 
fill at the top, macrophage at the bottom, and all I'm doing is switching. game you get to do it you get to change surface molecules and each one of those has a different function we'll do that later so what's really important is to get uh, intuitive understanding of something before uh, before you have to memorize everything and and with molecular biology we don't do that we generally wait until you're older before we tell you about these invisible things called proteins and because proteins are invisible, they're abstract, and that's why they're missing from everybody's understanding of how your body works. So what I want to do is find a way to get grade school kids and also all of us computer people playing games and get this intuitive understanding, and then we can build up. And if, in case you want to know, this is what's called the spiral curriculum, where you tell somebody something basic once, intuitively, and then come back and build on that the next year. And What's important is that playing a game where you have this ball and you switch these thingamajobs on it and it can do different things with different thingamajobs, that's the intuitive learning. And you can't test for that because you can't write thingamajob on a standardized test because other people are calling them doohickeys. That just doesn't work. And so that's why learning games have this giant paragraph of text and then you're allowed to do something because they're assessing you for your actual formal learning and not for your intuitive learning. So if you want to make a science game, find a way to test the intuitive learning, and then you can use that uh, evidence to get your funding, and that's what we were doing. Another extremely important reason why we need to show these concepts to younger people and to non-scientists, because misconceptions are really hard to unteach. One of the biggest misconceptions that people have is that molecules know where they're going. Molecules are trying to get to a lower concentration, or you know that I won't get sick. You know my body knows how to fight things off. Molecules move randomly. Everything in your body happens stochastically. Um, it's out of your control. Yet processes still happen. So uh, a really great collaborator of mine, uh, Mike Klimkowski, did. A, did years of study showing that um, students graduate from their freshman undergraduate biology class with great grades, and they still have these misconceptions. For example, the fact that uh, one molecule on one side of a cell knows where it's going. It knows it has to get to this enzyme in order to get processed, and, and that it can find each other. It's a really giant figure in everything, but the point of this whole figure is that even after a year of a class in which the teacher knew about these misconceptions and was teaching against them, the, uh, the misconceptions still existed at the end, that the majority of the kids still thought molecules knew where they were going and not getting around in a random way. So one of the things I really built into immune defense was the fact that uh, molecules move randomly. And so we're going to see our cell going to follow molecules and we can follow the cytokines and you really get a sense of the fact that the cell does not exactly know where it's going, those molecules don't exactly know where it's going, and everything is really happening by accident. So we're going to zoom in a second to be able to see. There's a cloud of cytokines around the bacteria and those cytokines are moving randomly and it just turns out that they form a cloud around it and diffuse away. And we're we see our cells, sometimes it's moving away from the bacteria and sometimes it's moving towards them. And that depends on when it binds to a cytokine. So that, that was uh, why, or we're going to get on to how, any questions, you can interrupt me any time. Okay, so this is the part where I show you how I've evaluated uh, 
a game. So Immune Attack was a game. Immune Attack's not my game. It's a third-person shooter that takes place inside the body. I moved from my lab in 2008 to a nonprofit at Washington, D.C., Federation of American Scientists. And they had just finished this really awesome learning game called Immune Attack. It's a third-person shooter inside the body, and you can fly a nanobot around, and you can see proteins, and you have a ray gun that lets you activate the proteins. There you go. You've activated one. It's got a big triangle on top of it now because it's activated. And that thing at the very top is a monocyte. So we've labeled it here, monocyte, the big ball. And it's got some doohickeys sticking out of it. And uh, the proteins were in a vein. I don't know if you can tell. And there are proteins sticking out of the vein and proteins sticking out of the cell. And they're going to bind each other if you activate them. And so now our monocyte is rolling along the inside surface of the vein. And that's your goal for the beginning of immune attack. So as things happen often, you know, we got the game, the Federation of American Scientists had the game finished. And they didn't have an evaluation plan or any funding left to evaluate it. And they were planning on talking about you know, evaluating it for big issues, like what kind of cells are involved in the immune response and things like that. But I looked at it and said, this is a biochemistry game. We're looking at protein functions. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to evaluate it for protein function and biochemistry. And then also whether people are more confident in their abilities to understand science after playing this game. So basically, I popped in. There was a game already done, and I had to find a way to evaluate it. Um, I came up with the short protocol. I wrote an IRB protocol. If anybody wants to talk about the details of evaluation, we can talk about that. It's not as hard as you think. People always say, oh, that's so hard. Um, IRB probably is harder than doing a Kickstarter but <laughs> similar. All right, so um, we just... What does it stand for? Oh, IRB stands for Internal Review Board. And really, here's the thing. There's a federal law that says if you're going to publish research data on people, you need to follow these rules. Like, you can't let people have syphilis and not tell them. <laughs> and people had done that. And so now we have laws against it. So the federal law says, if you are going to test on people, um, they need to know, and you're not allowed to publish their data, their names and addresses, for instance. And there are exceptions. The number one exception is if you're in a classroom and you're doing classroom-like things that the kids are normally doing, you're exempt. But you need an IRB, an internal review board, to agree that your protocol is really exempt because you're not allowed to just say, I follow the rules myself. And that'll cost you a lot of paperwork and $500 if you're lucky. And that's why teachers can't conduct studies on their own kids. And this is why hordes of learning data are being just blown to the wind because of, don't get me started. But it's not really an experiment. You've got a woman who's done like fifth grade for the past 15 years, and she could probably publish some data. And no one can adopt someone's methods if there's no data published. So that's why we have chalkboards. Or oh, maybe whiteboards. Yeah, OK. All right, all right. So we had a three-day protocol. The kids would play my game, immune attack or a, a different game. So I divided them up randomly, asked the teachers to divide them randomly into two groups. So then I could have like 20 different classrooms with half playing immune sack, half playing a control game. The control game is really cool too. It's also, I'll tell you about it later. Anyway, after they played twice, so once one week, once the second week, 24 hours after the second time, they took a test. It took me three years to develop the test because if you're going to test for learning, you need to have a very high alpha score for reliability, and you need a lot of statistics, and you need to demonstrate that your test is actually bringing back learning. So we had many rounds, and then we got to the four final rounds, and this is our um, reliability score. It's a pretty good one. Um, and I ended up with 27 multiple choice questions that uh, scientists and 
teachers agreed. We're really getting at the, um, you know, the what kids need to learn. Like, can you remember the name of this cell? Is a monocyte. This one's a neutrophil. Do you know the difference between a monocyte and a T cell? Yes, the difference is uh, their proteins. It's not their DNA. So similar questions like that. And we can see the gray line are the control kids, and they got about eight questions right. These kids are high school students. They're aged 10th grade to 12th grade. And the black line are the immune attack players, and they average just 12.5 questions right, which is statistically significant, and we're all very happy about that. And because you guys are game people, I put in all kinds of fun data. So boys and girls, gamers and non-gamers did equally well and statistically significant on the test of 27 questions. Um, I asked the kids how many hours they played video games a week. 40% uh, of them said zero. And um, I don't believe them. <laughs> yeah. I also asked them, you know, what kind of games do you play? And so uh, they had five different choices, you know, first person shooter, phone games. And so even the kids who said zero, they had some kind of game that they reported playing. And um, they could go up to 40 hours a week. So I was looking for a really funny data I have. Everybody's always reported. So like kids who play about one to five hours of games do better on tests in general. And, and then I have, I have like eight or maybe 20 kids who reported playing 40 hours a week of video games. <laughs> and they all did worse on the test. It's, it's kind of funny. OK. So um, I wanted to find out if um, the gameplay in immune attack is very similar to a regular hardcore game. You need to do ASDW and uh, you need to right click on the mouse. It's a real PC game and it's, it predates tablets. It's, it's, not a, it's not a plans versus zombies. This is first click here and then put a peapod. It's, it's very like, um, you know, press X to turn around. And then the tutorial doesn't tell you anything else until you turn around. So uh, it's really hard to get started and really hard to manage if you're not a PC gamer already. So I was afraid that our kids would be like, oh god, immunology is really hard. You need to you know, right click on the mouse and fly in three dimensional space. And so I, uh, I did a lot of testing for how far they got in the game and how much they learned and, and um, everything. So we found, you know, even kids who only did the first level could still answer the questions on the test statistically significantly better than controls. So controls always that gray bar on the far right. But if you played more levels of the game, you answered more questions, right? And if you reported that the game was easy to play, you were also more likely to get more questions right. It's just barely statistically significant between the two ones and the fives. OK. So here's some fun kind of uh, intuitive testing that I did. So I, I wanted to see if the kids you know, knew what was going on. And you can see that a very large percentage of all the kids know, I need to shoot that yellow thing to win this level. Sometimes it's even higher. Um, but a smaller percentage, still significant, great, 50% of the kids know that that thing is a protein. And then um, a similar 15% know that that protein is going to make that white blood cell slow down. And so this kind of testing is what I recommend to anyone who wants to try to um, demonstrate that your game is teaching. Okay, here's more fun stuff. Uh, you know, monocytes, you play with the monocyte, it runs over you, it makes your ship explode. And so people can remember uh, that was the monocyte. And they, when you show them that picture, that's a very typical picture of a, you know, a science schematic. And so it's nice that they usually can pick out that it's a white blood cell, that it's not a bacteria cell. That U-shaped thing is a nucleus. OK. And uh, the neutrophils, you don't really see them much in the game. So no one remembers that they're green. OK, I'm moving on quickly. This is the confidence picture. So this is what I call um, like your first day in grad school. You see one of these things, and do you panic? <laughs> there was a moment when I was like in eighth grade, and I knew I wanted to be a biochemist. But I had never seen a biochemistry book. 
and I got a hold of one. I went to visit somebody at a university, and I saw a biochemistry book, and I looked at it, and I'm like, oh, God, you know, I don't know any of this stuff. So how do you feel the first time you see that? So uh, mostly, as adults, we open the New York Times, and we're like, oh, shit, that's the science section. <laughs> <laughs> that's not for me. I'm not going to read that stuff. But, you know, if it's Pokemon or, you know, Smash Bros or whatever, you know, like, like oh, I know all that stuff. That's kryptonite and you can't see through lead and we know all those things. So what I wanted to find out is if you play this video game, will you feel like that's your stuff? That's your story. That's your character that, that you're familiar with. So I invented this question. And from the first time I tested it, it went, it went like gangbusters. Um, I just wanted to know if you thought you could understand it. And um, the black line are the immune attack players, and the gray line are their classmates that did not play the game. And so you can see that uh, almost 30% of the control kids said, number one, I don't think, I definitely disagree that I'll be able to understand that. And you know, 25% said two. So they're, they're definitely negative. And if they've played immune attack, they're uh, only 10% say that I, I totally can't get that. And the control image there is, is a macrophage. The game has macrophages in it, but this one is flat and yellow and doesn't look anything like the ones in the game. And we see there's no difference in the kids' um, uh, level of confidence with that image. Then um, the other pretty exciting thing that I thought was this. Um, this is a data image, so um, we've been talking about white blood cells inside of a vein, and they're sticking if, there's, if the proteins are activated. So this experiment was done by a professor at Cornell, and he has um, vein cells cultured in a dish, and those bumpy bits in the first panel, those are, those are cells cultured in a dish, and then he washed those cells with uh, white blood cells. And on the second panel, you can see white blood cells stuck. And in, in the third panel, is zoom in. And I rewrote the legend just a little bit so that it used words from the game. White blood cells and selectin protein and, and things like that. Um, yeah. And I asked the kids, do you think you could understand this? And the game players were more likely to say yes. Statistically significant when you look at the averages. So I was really excited because this is the kind of thing we need the public to be able to do. Open the New York Times, read the images, read the pictures and the charts and the graphs. You know, if I'm a, <laughs> if I'm a successful professor using your tax dollars to solve important problems, how are you going to know? Um, this is also very important for plaque formation and atherosclerosis, which kills most of us. Okay. And so, oh, yeah? So, hey, what's your, what's your conclusion? That, that, that confidence, that understanding observation, I think is really, really significant. And I think it's <laughs> significant to everybody here in the room. What's your conclusion from just that observation? Okay. My can, I, can I put words in your mouth and say <laughs> that with an effective game, we can introduce, we can introduce newer and more complex concepts to more kids at an earlier age for deeper understanding. Absolutely. That is your take-home message. Sean McCann has said it, everyone. <laughs> Very good, yeah. So we can move molecular science. It's no longer abstract. We can put it down in that early part of the triangle, fifth grade. Why not? And, and actually, um, you know, seven-year-olds play the game and start explaining to their parents what white blood cells are doing and how to change the surface receptors. I mean, of course they do, you know. <laughs> yeah, we definitely can. And, and I hope also that adults will like playing it and also, you know, accidentally start learning about surface proteins. It's absolutely true. And the other thing I think is really important is that Oh, sorry. We should draw the game <laughs> like science diagrams in order that when you do see a science diagram after playing the game, you'll think that's familiar. Because as you see that textbook, I really hate that textbook with those yellow macrophages. It doesn't look familiar. It doesn't look any different. It, because So if you're a teacher, you should really say, oh, look, these, these are images from the game. And we're going to put them up. So 
my plan for immune, immune defense, the game I'm making, the one I've showed you video, is um, to put a list of teaching standards and a list of gameplay videos, so gameplay trailers for the teachers. And if the teacher needs to show random motion, they can put up that one I just showed and say this is, this is proteins and moving randomly, and the kids have already played it, so they already have a working functional definition of the word protein and of the word diffusion, and you can build on that intuitive knowledge. Yeah, and so we're also gonna always have the first six levels of the game, you know, 20 minutes of gameplay will be free, so teachers everywhere can assign it. And then what we're really counting on is that the strategic gameplay is gonna be so fun that one kid in every class will pay for it and buy the rest of the game. So your <laughs> new marketing strategy, we'll see how it works. Okay, so uh, basically, all I was gonna say is like, now we've done all this research about how to present and what, what works, we're, I'm at that point, that same point that all of you are at, is how to make the game more engaging. Because we've, we saw that kids who thought it was easier correlated with those kids who played more of it, and that correlated with those kids who could answer more questions. So we didn't put them off, but it seems as if we could get more people to play more game, we could teach more stuff. So I wanted to make a more casual game, a game that would go on tablets, a game that would be more intuitive and um, totally trying to make it more, more engaging. And that's why also I stepped out of nonprofit world and went into the indie game world because I don't really want to spend half my budget on a three-year evaluation program where I need to make multiple choice questions. What I really want to do is just make more fun games. Okay, so engaging more people, re retaining players, replayability, those are the things we're all interested in. So this is, this is our current tutorial for immune defense. My apologies if you've all played it already. This is our awesome introduction at the moment. <laughs> Sean, the artist, is laughing. <laughs> Basically, you're a new professor. You get to fly the microbot for the first time. And you're very excited. All you're doing is going to explode into it. So, George Pan is the Plants vs. Zombies designer. And I've watched that tutorial. How to make your mom play Plants vs. Zombies like 8,000 times. And the GDC board. So, there's an E. coli, that's the only thing on the screen, and we say that's the bacteria, those, that's the name of it, E. coli. Here's a database, everything's collectible, and there's a page for everything. Got stars, it's <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You get inflammation bonus. So inflammation, your your job is to maintain that area. You have a real small area because you're a brand new microbot pilot, and inflammation is is the red part on a, you know in your when you have an infection, and um, inflammation is caused by your body responding to the bacteria. So. Um, the white blood cells are causing inflammation. They're destroying the bacteria with acid and, and, and also oxidizing molecules like O2 or o, OH and all the things that are causing damage, you know, the things that we take antioxidants for. Well, your body's cranking them out in order to kill these bacteria. And so you're causing a lot of tissue damage. And your job as a microbot is to speed up the immune system so that you, you clear the infection with minimal inflammation. So all the microbot pilots in our little <laughs> microbot world 
are trained to reduce inflammation in their area. And if inflammation gets too high in your area, you're yanked out and you got to start over. That's the story. <laughs> okay, so that's the tutorial that's bringing you into the world slowly and carefully. And um, we, uh, we had about like 8,000 tutorial versions. But then replayability and more levels. Like, how do you do that? So we've got like hundreds of pathogens we can go to. Lots and lots of really cool stuff. There's pathogens that divide before you can eat them. We've got some that don't die when you put them in the acid. We got some that get out of those little vessels and they swim around inside your blood, inside of your white blood cell. And then you need to buy a killer cell to kill the white blood cell. Yep, it's awesome. Are these are you mimicking realistic immune responses to these? Mm -hmm. So there is a there is a realistic way to control certain antibodies in your game or in your body or uh, yeah is no there is. You need antiretrovirals to control AIDS. And so in the game, you can buy drugs. Yeah, that's the plan. That won't be in the version we're putting out for the Kickstarter <laughs> before, before Greg throws something at me. <laughs> um, yeah, but that, that's the only way to control AIDS, drugs. But you get to find out why by playing the game. <laughs> yeah, and it's really, really cool. <laughs> I've been talking too long. Okay, so there you are. That's Molecular J Games. This is hopefully starting Tuesday. Um, uh, it's, it's me. It's Greg Chudecki back there with the video camera. He's the brand new CTO of Molecular J Games. And um, sciencegamecenter.org is where I put all kinds of science games. There's a couple of local companies that have made science games. Oh, applying for a grant. Oh. If you want to apply for a grant, you go to grants.gov. It's very complicated. You need an evaluation team. You need to co-work with a scientist and get a scientist to work with you through the whole part. So you get the scientist to sit with you at the beginning. Basically, just hire them. They're cheap. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they become a game designer on your team. Like, you know, they're like Klingon experts. They know the Klingon language, and they can make sure your game is real. They know all the Lego parts and, you know. Um, so then you, you uh, do the whole brainstorming bit and come up with the mechanism and game and stuff. And then it's, it's pretty typical standard for game development, right? You develop, then you test it, and you, you discuss the results. But all along, you're looking for whether people understand the science and whether you've added any misconceptions. So when you're doing the usability testing, you're, you're looking also to see what they, what they understand. So get them to answer some essay questions and then keep your, keep your scientists and your um, teaching experts around to interpret the results of the essay questions. Yeah? Do you have this diagram as a separate published anywhere? Because yes. It's the, it's the sketchbook for how to make a real educational game. It's on my blog at molecularjig.com. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, uh, that is. It's there. So um, it, under under research, you can find my paper, and it, under the blog, you can find that diagram. And soon, my paper was published by the Royal Society of Chemistry. Isn't that cool? Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks. Peer reviewed, don't you know? Yeah. Thanks. Okay, these are other people who make science games in Seattle. None of them are here tonight, but they're awesome. And hey, sweet. Okay, well, sciencegamecenter.org is our magazine for science games, and we want to put your game on there. And um, it's a place where you can review games because uh, you know, like, Immune Attack was a really hard game, and teachers didn't want to give it to their fifth graders because it's about receptors and proteins. The fifth graders are like, give me that stuff. I want to play that. And so what I thought the sciencegamecenter.org would be is a place where fifth graders could say, I love this game. And then, and so it's working out. We've got 1,800 registered users. And um, uh, we get 100 
new users a month. So sciencegamecenter.org, go there and review games. If you're a developer, we'll put you down as a developer and you can review it from a game design point of view. Awesome, okay, that, that is it, I'm done. <laughs> Any more questions? So, uh, yeah, so marketing to schools is notoriously a terrible way to market anything. Because here's the deal, teachers have 150 standards they need to teach, and they put all their money into a textbook that will teach 150 standards. They don't have $10 for something that teaches one standard. You know, and they don't even have time to play a game or go through it or figure it out. Like. Um, but there are things called um, homework, <laughs> and there's things called uh, flipped classrooms. Uh, so a lot of times teachers will record themselves giving a lecture, and then the kids watch the lecture at home, and then in class they have a discussion. So it maximizes your contact with the teacher and minimizes your standing, you know, just listening. And um, games are something that uh, teachers can assign that way. And so I really think we're going to have a large market of teachers who are like, awesome, it's free. There's a list of these standards that it, that it teaches, and I can send the kids home to play it on any device or at the library on the web and things like that. So I don't think everybody knows, actually, that trying to get your game accepted by a district is impossible unless you have to answer multiple choice questions to win the level. Dimension M is a math game that's super po popular. The whole state of Virginia and West Virginia bought it for all their kids, and you can do an obstacle course, and in order to jump to the next obstacle, you need to answer a multiple choice math question. <laughs> but it's perfect, right? You answer the question, so now the teacher knows you did it. And if you're in the fifth grade, you can play against 12th graders and obstacle them. Yeah. And I have not done any informal testing yet, so that's, that's my next IRB protocol that I'm going to write up. And that's what we want to do with the game. So we'll put it on tablets and then ask questions at the end or get people to type in, like, what did you do, and say it in your own words. But um, in order to do a peer-reviewed paper, you really need controlled conditions. And you need the teacher to say, uh, these students were there, and they played for 40 minutes, and we had this technical problem, and so they only played for 30. Any more questions? Ooh. Um, I'm still trying to understand what the goal of the game is. Is it to teach biochemistry? And if that's the case, do you have any sort of secondary goals around um, maybe increased education, increased interest in STEM education, um, or um, increased, uh, let's say, interest in STEM education in populations that typically don't have a big interest in STEM education? Well, um, now that I've moved into the indie game development world, my goal is to sell copies of this game. That's right. So I spent three years, basically. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's all of our goals. It's got to be a good goal. I spent three years working out with 40 different professors of immunology uh, and biochemistry and metabolism. Like, what's a pretty good way to let the player have agency and do cool stuff, but still see how the system actually works? And, and so that, that was, we've got the whole immune system mapped out game-wise, and, and that took a lot of time. And now that it's all done and it's real, we can make it fun to play. And we'll, we'll do rounds of testing and make sure we haven't introduced uh, misunderstandings, but that is the goal. It's, it's a real, it's a real game, so we're going to make it as fun as possible. Um, there's also a big disconnect between um, I want to be a scientist, you know, like a little ten-year-old Susie saying I want to be a scientist, and teaching a little ten-year-old Susie what a receptor is. 
because scientists, I mean, are they a physicist? Are they astrophysicist? Are, are they, um, you know, an animal husbandry expert? You know, like scientists are everything and nobody really knows what that means. And so when I, when I was testing, I never asked kids, do you want to be a scientist? But I did ask them, do you think you can understand this diagram? Because what I, what I, my goal is for all of you after playing the game to think, oh, those are receptors. I know what those do. And here's a new receptor that they found, and I, I want to know what it does. That's my goal. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions, anybody? Uh, I went through a whole lot of stuff really fast. Hi. My, I'm curious to hear your take on funding a game such as this. It's, so as an indie dev, Mm -hmm. Your self-funding, crowdfunding, maybe a publisher to fund development. But if you're making a science game, are there other areas that you can look to get funding for like immune defense or attack? What did you do to fund your games? Uh, okay, yeah, absolutely. So um, in 2008, I got to immune, uh, immune attack and the Federation of American Scientists. I was working for a nonprofit. I wrote a grant to the National Institutes of Health and I said, here's immune attack, we're going to evaluate it. Hypothesis one and hypothesis two was that we can take the data we get and make a new game, to an even better game. And, and I got funding. And um, yeah, I, what I had to do was demonstrate whether or not kids are learning. But what they also want to know is, um, if someone else wants to come along behind you and make a learning game, what can they learn from your experience? You know, like science is supposed to be standing on the shoulders of other people. So I, I can show you that the style of the game matters a little, but it's, it's not detrimental, but it does matter. And so the next person making a video game can say that. And so basically, if you're going to write a research grant to do research, you're writing on how do games teach and, and, and what do we need to do to make them teach. And they want peer-reviewed publications. They don't want a game. Yeah. So our budget per year was $60,000 a year for all development. And it was spread over five years. Now, fast forward 10 years, or however many that would be, <laughs> and um, the National Science Foundation and the NIH, both of them are making new kinds of games, uh, new kinds of grants where you get more money per year and it's a shorter schedule. So you get like three years, $400,000 a year for everything. But you still need to pay if, uh, education experts and um, all, all that. So you don't have like, you know, 400000 to do dev. You have 400000 to pay somebody and their overhead to be the designer and the scientist and the evaluation team and stuff like that. But you can do it. That's research grants. The other thing that they have are called small business innovation research grants, and that's for us, us business people, and it's for small business, and it's f to pay you to do the legwork to figure out how to take your science and make it a real commercial product. It's to fund that gap in between. So the deadline's in May for biology games from the National Institutes of Health. It's a totally wild, giant new thing that they're doing, and we'll be applying. And um, uh, other sciences, it's harder to figure out where to apply, but National Science Foundation has a lot of grants. So their uh, informalscience.org site has a lot of information. And anybody wants to talk to me anytime about how to write a grant. Uh, thank you. Sure. Any other questions, anybody? I know I've got a dozen, but I'm not going to um, monopolize the time. So. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Any, uh, because we learned a lot tonight, especially about uh, how games teach and then how you can build a game that teaches. That's probably two pretty very important things. So uh, if nobody else, oh, here we go. Yeah, hi, I'm Toby from Germany, traveling hi. through. So, And I was wondering uh, on the sciencegames.gov, do you have, uh, so it's a global community, so there is researchers from all types, uh, from Europe as well, or is it 
taking off in the States mainly? What is your... Sciencegamecenter.org is yeah. my little site. And yeah, anybody who wants to be on it can be on it. Um, we don't write any articles in German yet, but... <laughs> Yeah. It's sciencegamecenter.org, it's just anybody. And um, Hero Coli is on there, it's a French game from Paris. Uh, but they don't, they don't have a demo yet, so. Um, yeah, anybody. Uh, NSF will fund you if you're American, mm -hmm. National Science Foundation. And informalscience.org is, is NSF. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm running, or we are running conferences in uh, Berlin and Cologne during Gamescom, and I was wondering whether mm. Since we had this whole serious games movement from 2008 uh, with different waves, uh, so it worked, it didn't work, <laughs> it had these strange tests and sometimes uh, got left a lot of burnt, burnt soil uh, behind. So I'm wondering, okay, is this, as you, uh, so I'm, I'm motivated if I hear you talk to bring this up again at our conferences in Berlin. Uh, to make it as a topic to discuss in Europe as well. So thank you for sharing. Cool. Yeah, I think there's a lot of really good learning games that are coming out, and they're coming out from our community. They're not. They're not coming out really from the um, educational community, and the reason is we need to sell games. Educational community needs to publish papers. You don't get tenure for having a game. And they were making, you know, short games, and then they'd show what you learned, and 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 that's great. It, but yeah, if you wanna, if you wanna really make a game, so like Voyager, um, you can you can get your uh, satellite to fly past the moon and take pictures of it, and you get to see the video of the moon after you flew past it. Yeah, it, there's a lot of great stuff. And Science Game Center, play them. We want to, if anybody wants to play Immune Defense after this, we are kicking off a Kickstarter next week. So if anybody would like to be filmed enjoying the game, we could use you. That would be really awesome. And any, you know, any more questions, anytime. Any other questions? I got one. Okay. Um. I was wondering what age group in particular you were aiming towards, more for high schoolers or like fifth and sixth graders, because I'd imagine your user interface is going to vary slightly, or your gameplay um, complexity is going to vary slightly for which age group. You're right. We're aiming, we tested on 16-year-olds, all the play testing we've done with Immune Defense so far, 16. And I think, it's, I think it skews a little older even, it's kind of complex, but the 16-year-olds, they want it to look more real. All the feedback I get is like, it looks too cartoony. They want it to look more real. They're like, is this really happening? I asked them, I guess I tested in DC, in the DC public schools, would you pay for it? Would you give me $3 for this game? And they're like, is it real? Because <laughs> we don't want to waste our time if it's not real. Thank you. That's it, gang. Let's, uh, uh, let's hear from Melanie. Um, we're, uh, we're running a little bit behind, but I do want to have Kate from the, uh, from the, I'm sorry, Kate is the executive director of the, IG, of the, of IGDA.org, right, essentially, the global organization, and uh, she comes to as many of these as she can because Seattle is her home city, and I uh, wanted to talk, she has 90 seconds to talk about IGDA. Okay, great. Um, well, I know a lot of you in here already, but if you don't know me, I, d I am based in Seattle, and I do run the global IGDA organization. And um, if you're not a member of the IGDA, I encourage you to go to IGDA.org and check it out. We have got a lot of member benefits, a lot of event-based stuff. We've got tangible benefits as well. Um, we're always trying to add more stuff like software and hardware and all that kind of stuff. Um, we've got some of that already, and we're adding more soon so if you're curious just go to the website and check it out um, some people just join because they want to support what the organization does like being really vocal about certain social issues over the last few months yes um, that's a great example I'm glad you brought that up so one of the things that we did we just launched it yesterday in fact is an online harassment resource um, a resource center so if you in light of the recent months and activities going on in our industry, we have a whole list of resources on the website 
that all kinds of stuff, like if you're being harassed or doxxed or anything like that, there's advice on what to do immediately versus long-term stuff, how to protect yourself online, all kinds of stuff like that. So that was something that our Women in Games SIG put together and it's up on the website right now. So we do all kinds of stuff like that um, to help developers of all kinds. Doesn't matter who you are, if you're a one-person team or if you work for Amazon or Microsoft or whoever. So there you go.